perfect day to give thanks unto the Lord and to bless his holy name. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This is a beautiful day. Give God praise. The weather's nice. The wind's blowing. The sky is beautiful. It just reminds you of the goodness of God. And it's so awesome when you know that God is on your side that you're able to praise his name and give him glory because he deserves it all. Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk about in our lesson the heart's true condition. The heart's true condition. So we're going to go ahead and get into a word of prayer. Then I'm going to start the lesson tonight. And I pray that others come on. I do apologize for the lateness. But nevertheless, better late than never. Because truly God's word is still to be preached, teach, minister to God's people to help set the captives free. Amen. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for your sovereignty and your holiness, God, and your righteousness. I thank you for your presence, God, and for how your good and your mercy endures forever. I thank you for bringing us through the business of the day, God. Now, Father, I ask that you remove the business of the day from our minds, that we have a heart to focus on you, Lord God, to hear a rhema word that will help change our mindsets, our attitudes, our lifestyles, our nature, that would be conformed to your image and likeness every day by surrendering to your lordship and your authority. Cleanse our minds and hearts from sin and iniquity, O God. Anything that's not like you in the midst of us, O God, take it out. In the mighty name of Jesus, that we have nothing to hinder us from receiving the word of the Lord. We know, Father God, you said man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we come, God, as vessels, surrendering ourselves to your lordship and your authority, God, that you'll be in control of our actions, the words we speak out of our mouths, and the things we do with our lives, O oh God, that we bring you glory in everything we do. Thanks, God, right now to reveal your word to us, God, in such a way that will help give us an insight into the mysteries of the gospel, that we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. And we give you glory, give you honor, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining. I do apologize for the lateness today. I went to the movies earlier. And I know it's going to be that late getting back. But I tell you, I went to go see Thor, the new Thor that just came out. And that dealt with uh, a message of love and sacrifice. It's so awesome when you recognize the spirit of living God moving in your life, how God will remind us of the sacrifice he made for us when we were yet without strength and sinners. God allowed Christ to die in our place that we would that he would demonstrate his love to us as his people to bring us into a revelation and an understanding of who he is to us. And when you know the love of God, it doesn't matter what goes on around you. You can stay secure in his presence, knowing that God is on your side, leading, guiding, directing you in the way of truth, in the way of righteousness. Hallelujah. I, I get excited about the word of God. It just Every time I read the word of God, it just, it, I get a different insight of the word from the spirit of living God. And I thank God for that, because when you desire to hunger and thirst after righteousness, God promises he will fill you. So you got to have that desire in yourself. One thing about God, he's not going to force himself on you, nor make you get to the place where you got to receive his word. It's freely given to us. His word is freely given to whoever's willing to receive the word of God. And the word will give you insight and will change your life forever. That, that's what that's the God we serve, a mighty God, sovereign God, holy God, loving God, a justful God. I tell you, he's merciful. Everything that he does is good and very good. And all you got to do is just receive it by faith and know with confidence in yourself 
that he's not holding your sins, you're transgressing against you. God knows you're going to make mistakes. He knows you're going to fall short of his glory. But yet he provided the remedy called the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus washed away our sins and our lawless deeds and our iniquities and taking our sins as far as the east as to the west to remember no more that we have the right and the privilege to come before the awesome presence of a holy God. The holy God, the omnipotent God, the omniscient, the omnipresent, the God who, whose El should die, who's more than enough, the God who promised to be Jehovah Jireh in our lives, no matter what our need is, he will supply according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Only if it's predicated on you seeking his face. That's all God asks for. In order for God to bless you, to open the windows of heaven, pour out blessings that you don't have enough room to receive, he wants you to seek him. And when you seek him, he said, you will be found of me and I'll be found of you. That's an awesome God we serve today. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Praise the Lord. Tonight, we're going to talk about the heart's true condition. The heart's true condition. Last week, we talked about the deceptive trap how the enemy sets different types of traps before God's people and it's familiar things that you know about, the things that you may have done before in your life, the people you may, may have been around, the circle you was included in that was full of sin and iniquity. And yet God says Satan wants to set some traps before you to lure you away from your identity, to lure you away from your purpose, to lure you away from the plan God has for your life and get you to fight and quarrel among each other in the body of Christ because he's not talking to sinners. He's saying the deceptive trap is for the believer. It's not for the unbeliever because he already got them on his side. They're on his team already. They're playing his game. But you as a believer have to be aware of the enemy's tactics and the traps that he set before you and the baits he used to lure you. There are so many different things in his word that entices us to sin against God. God tells in his word that when you desire to do wrong, guess what? Wrong will always be present with you. So you have to make up in your mindset that, you know what? I'm not giving it to the enemy's tactics. I know his strategies. I know his plan. I know what he's up to. And when you're praying and you're seeking God's face, you're spending time in the word, the wisdom of God. The knowledge of God begins to unfold to you and give you an understanding of what God is saying to you to change your life and protect you from just precariously walking to the traps of the enemy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So tonight we're going to talk about the harsh true condition. One way the enemy keeps a person in the offended state is to keep the offense hidden. That's a key point right there. The way the enemy uses this type of tactic against a child of God is to get you offended. When you get offended, you keep it hidden in your heart instead of letting go of the offense or forgiving the individual who caused the offense. You may have been the offenser, the one who caused the offense of someone else. And God's saying, repent. But instead of repenting, you hold on to the, the, the offense in your heart and it's hidden and it says it's cloaked with pride. So it's covered with pride. Pride goes before destruction, a healthy spirit before a fall. So if pride is the remedy the enemy uses against you. Guess what he does? He blinds you from truth. He'll blind you from seeing yourself the way God sees you, forgiving someone when they mistreat you. The word tells us if we forgive our brothers their trespasses, our Heavenly Father forgive us our trespasses. But if you do not forgive your brothers their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. So that's breaking the law. Trespass is breaking the law, going against God's word. So whatever it is the enemy uses in your life to keep you in bondage, the enemy knows exactly what to do to keep pride in your heart. A person who's prideful, he, if you've been around a person who's full of pride, they selfish, they self-exaltating, they're always talking about what they did, they're always talking about what they accomplished, they're always talking about how successful they are, they're always talking about how they did this and did that and created wealth. But when a person who's humble, they always magnify the Lord. Look what God done for me. I sought the Lord. 
He showed up in my life. He gave me an idea to become successful. I written it down. I got a vision from the Lord and I began to pray over that vision, ask God for instructions and counsel on how to bring this vision to pass in my life. And God brought it into my life successful. So now I'm successful because I trusted in God. If the word tells us it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. If I put confidence in myself, myself is absent of God because I don't want to hear from God. I don't want to follow his leadership. I don't want to follow his way of doing things because sometimes God's way take too long. One thing about God, he loves us so much. He gives us patience through patience and waiting. Ye shall inherit the promise. God tells us in the word that we got to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He shall what? Strengthen thine heart. So in the process of believing God for a better job, in the process of believing God to find a house, believing God for a better automobile, believing God to start a business, believing God to write a book, you have to have patience. Not only have patience, but you have to have endurance. Because sometimes it's going to linger in the process of putting things together to bring the idea God's giving you into fruition. But the enemy wants you to get to the place in yourself where you don't wait on God and you rush ahead of God. I found out something in my own life. Every time I try to do something to make ministry operate in my life ahead of God, it always collapsed. Just like trying to bake a cake without the flour, trying to bake a cake without putting the, the self rising in it or baking powder, whatever it is you use to make your, your cake rise without putting the right ingredient in it to make it rise, it flops. The Holy Spirit is the agent God has given us into our hearts. Whatever idea he gives you, whatever concept he gives you from the word of God to fulfill the call on your life, he gives you the remedy from the word of God that will empower you to trust God. So as I trust God, God begins to give me the idea, hey, if you do it this way, just like he told Peter when he was out fishing, he said, Lord, we taught all night long and caught nothing. Jesus said, cast your net on the other side. And what happened? They cast the net on the other side. And call more than they can handle. They have to call the other ships to come along to benefit from the blessing. When you walk in obedience, God multiplies the blessing on your life. When you walk in obedience and humility, God will cause the windows of heaven to open up, begin to rain down showers of blessing. It's in the world, it's in the book. He said, He'll rain showers of blessings on your life. But all you got to do is walk in obedience and trust God. Proverbs 16, chapter verse 18. Proverbs 16, chapter verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, chapter verse 23. Proverbs 29, chapter verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. That is so powerful because when I humble myself, God said he will exalt you. If you humble yourself, God will bring your vision to pass. When you humble yourself, God will rain, rain favor on your business and cause it to multiply. So you may have a little substance, just like when God told e e e Ezekiel to prophesy to the widow who had a, a, a little flower to make a cake and some oil, and die. Her vision was, I'm going to make this cake with the little oil and the flour I have. Me and my son, we're going to die. But because the man of God said, make me a cake first. If you do what I tell you to do, your meal barrel now going to run empty. And the man of God prophesied a word, a promise to this widow. She ate, made this cake for the man of God. And God blessed her meal barrel where it ran over. He said, you go sell what you got and pay your debts and keep what, what God wants you to have and everything you need going to be supplied. 
So it's very important as a children of God to allow the Spirit of God to keep you humble. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord. Check this out. The fear of the Lord. A lot of people think when they talk about fear, I got to be afraid of God. I got to hide from God. If I mess up, he going to give me that fatal blow. He going to destroy me. No, it's not talking about that. The fear that it's talking about is having respect and reverence for, for who God is in your life. It says the fear or the reverence of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. So God gives us instruction in the heart's condition. If you humble yourself, you're going to respect God enough to say, okay, God, I know I shouldn't do this, this evil deed. I'm not going to do it because you told me to hate evil. Not only that, God, you said don't walk in pride. No, get arrogant, puffed up. <coughs> You say the evil way to avoid in a throw up mouth, do I hate? So if I got to hate the thing that God hate and love the thing God's love. So just because people come into your circle and they're not where you are in the spirit, where you, where you have grit, grit, had grown to, is what I'm trying to say, where you have grown to, don't mean you got to eliminate those type of people. You have to love them unconditionally with the love of God. Not only that, you got to help bear their infirmities where they're weakened to build them up to the strongest standing on two feet. Don't get tired and weary just because somebody needs your help. We got to get into the place in ourselves to remember when I was yet without strength, when I couldn't get myself right, God sent the Savior to die on a whole rugged cross on a hill called Golgotha. And he died for you and for me in our weaknesses that we can receive salvation when he rose from the dead. So you got to get to place in yourself where you humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and allow the spirit of God to keep you in a place where you're built up in faith to trust God to bring you successful and make you prosperous in everything you do for the kingdom of God. Pride will keep you from admitting your heart's true condition. Pride. We all have a heart's condition. Is it a righteous heart condition or is it a sinful heart condition? The choice is yours. You have to decide within yourself and examine your heart to see what is it in my life that's preventing me from walking in holiness and righteousness. God says without holiness, no man can see the Lord. So I got to get in myself and recognize, okay, God, there's an issue I've been dealing with. There's a stronghold I've been dealing with. There's a habit that I've been dealing with, God. There's something I don't like about myself. Every time I look in the mirror, God, I see this sin in my life. God, what can I do to get rid of this issue? We all have a heart condition as an issue, a hindrance issue. It hinders you from being delivered. It hinders you from being healed. It hinders you from being victorious. It hinders you from walking in truth. But when you recognize that there's a form of pride in my heart, then I can allow God to humble me. You know one thing about God? He loved the children of Israel so much. It said he led them into the wilderness. To humble them. It's a dangerous place to be in where God has to humble you. You get so stubborn, get so prideful, so arrogant, so haughty, so rebellious, refuse to repent, refuse to ask God to forgive you for your sin and iniquities. It's a very dangerous position to be in. Because now you put yourself in the judgment of God. Because now you're saying, God, I don't want the mercy. I don't want the compassion. I want your judgment. You may say, I never said that with my mouth. Your actions say it. Your actions tell God, I'm not ready for your mercy and forgiveness. I need your judgment. Because if God puts in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit to tell you to repent of something you know that's not right in your life, and you don't do it, you're telling God, go ahead and judge me. 
And guess what? You invite the wrath of God to fall on your, your, your house, on your family, on your children, on your possessions. Everything you have becomes a curse. But my Bible tells me that cursed is he who hanged on the tree, which is Jesus Christ. But not only that, but he hung on the tree and he broke the power of the curse that you and I would no longer be held in captive to a curse. So if I am set free from the curse of the law of sin and death, then why am I living in a mindset of rebellion and stubbornness and refuse to turn my heart back to the Lord? The children of Israel many times rebelled against God and many times were driven into captivity. Are you in captivity tonight? Are you bound in your mindset? Are you bound in your heart? Where it seems to be hard to break free from the things that you've done so long that's wrong till you can't get out of it. Guess what? Repent. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And guess what that all is? It does not el el eliminate anything from being part of that all. Everything as a whole that holds you in captivity, that holds you in bondage, that holds you in iniquity, God says, all of that I will forgive. Only if you repent. Then it goes and said, once I was severely hurt by a couple of ministers, people would say, I can't believe they did this to you. Aren't you hurt? I would quickly respond, no, I'm fine. I'm not hurt. I knew it was wrong to be offended, so I denied and repressed it. Check that out. Denying and repressing offense is a dangerous thing in the eyes of God. I convinced myself I was not, but I really was in reality. Pride masked the true condition of my heart. Pride, it masked the true condition of my heart. And because of that, it kept me in a place of darkness and separation from God. Then he goes and said, pride keeps you from dealing with the truth. It, is, it distorts your vision. We can count out right here at this one statement. Pride keeps you from dealing with the truth. It distorts your vision. Many times when God gives us a vision, he gives a provision. The problem comes in I can't see the provision because my pride distorted my vision. When I'm living in sin and in rebellion, it gets me to a place where there's blinders on my eyes. So if the blinders cover my vision, I cannot see clearly what God has for me to see. So when I get into a dark place, it seems normal to be in a dark place. It seems normal to be in depression. It seems normal to be sick and afflicted. It seems normal to be absent of God in your life. When all the time God is still there. But because I masqueraded my pride to cover my vision, I can't see God working in my life to set me free. You never change when you think everything is fine. I remember when I was young in ministry, and I would get hurt by people. I would go to churches, never invite to preach, never invite to sing. But everybody else that was with me was invited to do different things in the church. I started getting hurt, being discarded, like left out, left behind. And my heart got hurt. So I would, I would cover with pride. Someone says, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I put on a smile on my face as if everything's okay. But deep within my heart, I was broken, I was torn, I was wounded because of rejection. Rejection is a bait that Satan uses to make you feel that you'll never be used by God. Not knowing it was God pruning me. You hear what I just said? Sometimes God will allow rejection to be placed in your life to prune you. Because if you get stubborn and you get high-minded and you start doing things without God, God has to break you down. And that's called humility. So he will humble you. He will bring you to a place where you recognize, 
I need God in my life. In order to fix this problem I'm dealing with, I need God. So when God started showing me, I was going through a pruning process to break that pride off my heart, to break that rebellious spirit out of my mind and my life. Because I was still dipping and dabbing in sin, but yeah, I call myself a minister of God. And when God started breaking me, and he started wounding me, he started hurting me to build me and to heal me. Because he healed the broken heart and he binds their wounds. Sometimes God will have to break you in order to heal you. So when he started doing this in my life, it was uncomfortable. I didn't feel good about it. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. But it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Because when God humbled me, like he did the children of Israel, he humbled them. Guess what he did? He fed me. He nurtured me. He primed me. He perfected me. He made me better. So when the time came to speak the word of God, the anointing came upon my life with power and authority. Here I just said, when God gets you in a position where you're ready to be used by him, the anointing endows you with power. And when that power came and I spoke a message, it set the whole church free where I was at. So I encourage you tonight, don't allow yourself to get in the way of God. When God tells you there's something in your life that's not right and you know what it is, don't resist. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Remember that. Your pride heart will keep you from being delivered. It'll keep you from walking in your purpose. It'll keep you from seeing the vision God has for you. But when you say, God, here it is, this drug addict, here it is, this alcoholic, here is God, this, this perversion heart, this homosexual heart, this demonic lifestyle, God, everything that's not like you, God, in my life, here it is. I'm laying at your feet. And guess what he does? He takes the blood of Jesus, and that blood begins to wash away with the word of God all your sinful deeds, as if you never made a mistake in his presence, because that's how much he loves us. He loves us enough to cover us, to clothe us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that everything we do will come to the place of being resembled in his image. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. I love it. I was looking at a scripture in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And verse uh, 1. In the Amplified Version, it says, Therefore, you have no excuse or defense or justification, O man, whoever you are, who judges and condemns another. So if you're one of these people who's talking about, you've been judging everybody else about their, the way their lives are, the sin they're doing, the things they're not, that's not right in their lives, he says, you who judges and condemns another for imposing as judge and passing sentence on another, you condemn yourself. So if you're judging somebody else and you got sin in your own life, God said, you condemning yourself. So this all ties in with the heart's true condition. Because God is trying to make known to us tonight, we got to know our heart. Guard your heart for out of it flows the issue of life. So you got to guard your heart tonight. You got to get back in position, get back on your, in your prayer cloth, get back in your prayer closet, get back to a place of consecration, get back to a place of seeking God's face and allow the spirit of God to close you in the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything in your heart that's not right, God, take it out. If it's not pleasing you, Lord God, take it out of me. I don't want it. I don't need it. I just want you. And when you tell God, God, I recognize that I'm one of these people who've been judging somebody else because you who judge are habitually practicing the very same thing that you censor and denounce. You keep record of and denounce it. You say, I ain't doing it, but I'm keeping record of everybody else's faults. And God says, because of this behavior of the heart, you, you condemn yourself. Pride hardens your heart and dims your eyes 
of understanding. Pride hardened your heart and dimmed your eyes of understanding. So you wonder why hell breaking loose in your life. You wonder why every time I get a job, I get fired. You're wondering why every time I get a check, I, I, I have a, a hole in my pocket. It keeps going so quick. I don't know why. God says, when his house lies dormant, tell me your house right here, the heart. When his house is dormant, you're not putting the things God wanted in it to dress it up. He said, he breathed on your money. He calls me like a bag with holes in it. So everything you get, you gain a lot and you end up with little. So you got to be careful how you judge somebody else about the lifestyle they're living because we're quick to judge homosexuals. We're quick to judge lesbians. We're quick to judge somebody as a prostitute. We're quick to judge the drug addicts. We're quick to judge everybody else. But we don't want to judge ourselves. And God is saying tonight, take the beam out of your own eye for you're trying to take the mote out of somebody else's eye. So the sin in your eye, take it out first for you can take it out of somebody else. Why? Because you got to get yourself right in order to help somebody else. How can I help somebody who's an alcoholic when I was an alcoholic and I'm still dipping in alcohol? And I'm still drinking every day, but I'm a child of God. How can I tell somebody who's an alcoholic, oh, God can deliver you, God can set you free, if I'm condemned myself? God says tonight, your heart's true condition, it matters to him. You can allow the spirit of the living God to come into your heart, to purge out of your heart the sin and iniquity that you've hidden in the treasure chest of your heart. Glory to God. <coughs> it keeps you from the change of heart. Repentance, that will set you free. Repentance is what will set you free. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 24 through 26. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. Pride causes you to view yourself as a victim. Ain't that something? I've been hurt so, so much, I feel like I'm a victim. I've been condemned so long, I feel like I'm a victim. So my attitude becomes I was mistreated and misjudged. Therefore, I am justified in my behavior. So I have the right. Check this out. This is good. I feel like I'm a victim. So my attitude becomes accustomed to the way people mistreated me. So I accept it. And now I feel I have the right to retaliate. I have the right to defend myself. I have the right to be reactive instead of proactive. Therefore, I am justified in my behavior. Because you believe you are innocent and falsely accused, you hold back forgiveness. Because you believe, check this out, you may not even been offended, but because somebody close you been offended, you feel like it's your offense. So I feel like because I've been mistreated or they've been mistreated, I've been mistreated too. So I believe I've been offended, even though I haven't even been offended. So I hold back forgiveness. So girl or guy, you ought to go on to, go on to give them peace of your mind. You ought to go on to, and, and get even with them. He ain't have to talk to you that way. Go on and, go on and give him what, what he deserves. So what women do, men do, because I believe I've been offended, I'm ready to kill you. I'm ready to assassinate you. I'm ready to take you out of this world. You look in the news, it's evidence. Every day, offended people kill other people because I believe that the government offended me. I believe that the polit political realm offended me. So therefore, I feel I can take vengeance in my own hands. I don't have to forgive people. I don't have to accept what they did to me anymore. I can become their judge and their jury and their sentencer. So everything they've done to me, I have the right to punish them. 
And God is saying, forgive. God is saying, let go of the offense. Let go of the hurt. Let go of the pain. And God is saying to us tonight, just because you believe you've been offended, check your heart's condition. Check your heart's thermometer. What is your heart's thermometer reading? Is it reading fire real hot in the 90s? Or is it reading in the 60 degrees of humbleness, humility, resting in the presence of God? Because if you let your heart's thermometer reach the high peak, the flesh takes over and the flesh tells you, now they're going to get what they deserve. I'm going to punish them for what they did to me. I didn't deserve them talking to me. I didn't deserve to lose my job. So I'm going to go shoot up the whole place. All because I was offended. Through your heart's true condition. So though your heart's true condition is hidden from you. Check this out. This is good. It's not hidden from God. Though your heart's true condition is hidden from you. It's not hidden from God. Just because you were mistreated. You do not have permission to hold on to an offense. Just because you believe, you feel, you've been mistreated, you do not have permission to become the judge, the jury, and the senator on anybody's life, not even your own life. God says this, vengeance is mine says the Lord, I will repay, right? So if God promises he'll take care of your enemy, all he's looking for you to do is say, okay, God, I give up. I cast my cares at your feet. I let you deal with it, God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. God said, okay, I'm going to take care of it. Your offender, they're in my hands now. I'm going to deal with your offender. I'm going to deal with the enemy who's using your offender to hurt you. And I'm going to bring them to the place of repentance. Even sometimes, and this is what people don't realize in the body of Christ. We always want to speak our mind when somebody mistreats us. We always want to make things right the way we know how, instead of trusting God. So every time someone cross me wrong, step on my toes, I get mad about it. I get angry. I get furious. I wasn't greeted right in the church. I wasn't welcomed in the church when I came in. I wasn't sitting in the right seat I wanted to sit in in the church. So because I'm offended, I'm going to hold on to an offense when God says forgive. So I'll become the better, the better person. I'll go to the individual who offended me, say, I forgive, forgive me if I've done anything to make you offend me. We ain't going to say it like that, but we go to somebody. This is what God is looking for a heart. They say, okay, I'm going to go to you, the person who offended me, who I believe offended me. Please forgive me if I've done anything to hurt you. If anything I can do to make things right, let me know. Because I don't want to have anything in our hearts against each other. That's humility. Pride says, no, you didn't greet me right when I came to the door. You shouldn't even be an usher in this church. You need to sit down somewhere. You don't have the right attitude. I don't know why I even came to this church in the first place. Guess what? I've been to church like that. I've seen people act like that. Anybody of Christ. And God every time says, don't have a heart condition with that type of attitude. Your attitude needs to achieve to the altitude of the kingdom. When you tap into the kingdom frequency to get the kingdom revelation, how to deal with a situation. That was profound what I just said. So when you allow the Spirit of God to govern your heart, the Holy Spirit, every single time, will give you the right words to say at the right time and the right moment that you need an answer on how to deal with an offense. And all you got to do is trust in God. Just because you were mistreated, you do not have permission to hold on to an offense. Two wrongs do not make a right. We heard that as children. Many of us grew up hearing that. Two wrongs don't make a right. 
And that's a true statement because I cannot fix something wrong if something wrong with me I have against you. You can't fix something wrong if you got something against me and I got something against you. So we got to come together and reconcile. Be ye reconciled, saith the Lord. Because when you reconcile, you allow the Spirit of God to bring you back to the place where you say, okay, God, I can't do this without you. But because of your grace and your mercy, I'm going to surrender to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 19, it says in the Amplified Version, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the whole world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses. I'm going to read that again. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling the, and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up, keeping record, and holding against men their trespasses, but counseling them, but counseling them, and committing to us the message of reconciliation, of the restoration of favor. So because God didn't keep record of our wrongdoings, he gave us the same message. The remedy to an offense is to be reconciled through the restoration of his favor. Because if God was in Christ reconciling, making things right between, between God and man, you and I are held accountable to do the same thing, to be reconciled between one another. So if you have a fault against somebody tonight, you need to make it right. Don't go to bed. Let the sun go down upon your wrath because you might not wake up in the morning. If somebody mistreated you or you mistreated somebody else, the word tells us we need to go to them and make things right. Because if you don't, you're putting yourself in danger of the judgment of God. And I guarantee it's not, not a guarantee you're going to wake up. Because it said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. So I encourage you tonight, through the word of God, to allow the word to minister to your heart. And allow the spirit of God to bring you to the place of reconciliation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, on your anger. When angry, in the Amplified Version, says, when angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperations, your fury, excuse me, or indignation last until the sun goes down. You need to be reconciled. You need to make things right between you and your brother and your sister. Because God tells us in his word, don't let this hinder you from receiving the promises God has for your life. So we're going to end right here next week. We're going to talk about the cure. We're going to talk about the cure next week. So share this word with somebody else. Encourage them to join us. We'll be back on at 6 o'clock next week, Tuesday. The Lord says the same. But don't allow yourself to be hindered from walking in obedience to God's word and repentance. If you know in your heart tonight that something is right with you and somebody else, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, if I wrong somebody and I know I wrong somebody, forgive me. Give me the willpower and a heart's desire to go and make things right with the offender or if I'm the one who offended somebody else, God, help me to do what's right, to make things right between me and the other person, that you would get the glory. Now, I ask, Lord God, that you forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and come into my heart 
and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, God is holding you accountable because now you confess with your mouth what you have done. If anything not right with you, then you give God the permission to make things right between you and another person or even judge you when you don't repent because you're held accountable. Because God said the heart of man is desperately wicked. No one knows it save God. And he will render, give you your punishment to everyone who's accountable for their doings. God says, I'm going to judge you based on your doings. So tonight I encourage you, practice living in righteousness. Allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and make things right between you and God. And I tell you tonight, when you do that, you'll you have such a peace flood your heart like never before. And no matter what you go through in this life, nothing the enemy does to you can hinder you from receiving the promises God has for you in your life. So I also want to ask you tonight, if you will, walk in faith and sow a seed into the ministry. Sow a seed into the ministry. We need your help. We're in the process of trusting God to build our church, expand our church. Also, it helps me with the materials that we need for the Bible classes. Everything that God gives me, I use it to help build the ministry for the kingdom of God. And that's what we all supposed to do. It's okay to have money and use it for what you want to use it for. But don't forget about the house of God. Because the word says we ought to take care of the house. He said a laborer is worthy of his hire. And if God calls you to minister the gospel, you're worthy of your hire. And it's a guarantee God will bless you every single time. So as I'm giving my time to teach these lessons, God expects you to give your time to sow a seed into the ministry to bless his people. And I guarantee when you do that, you open the windows of heaven and allow God to begin to bless you even more. Because when you give, it's a guarantee it'll come back to you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. God will cause other people to come into your life and bless you. Not only that, but he said, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. And that's a natural law of sowing and reaping. So if you sow, he says, the guarantee you're going to reap. So if you sow corruption, you, you're going to reap corruption. But if you sow righteousness, you, you receive righteousness. So I encourage you tonight, be a blessing to the ministry. Allow the Spirit of God to convict your heart, to cause you to walk in obedience, to sow a seed into the ministry. I place the info on, on the link tonight that you can sow your seed to my cash out. And every seed goes right back into the ministry to do what God wants to be done. And I tell you, when you do that, God himself will show up in your life and bless you tremendously. It's, it's awesome and amazing what God is doing in our lives. So I tell you tonight, stay encouraged. Don't allow the enemy to stop you from walking in the truth of God's word, walking in obedience. And when you obey God, it's a guarantee God will continue to bless you with what you have a desire for and what you need for. So tonight I'm going to pray before we leave. Blessings and favor over you tonight. Because a lot of us need blessings tonight. We need something God to do in our lives. It doesn't matter about the seed, what it is. It doesn't matter the amount. I had someone so fired up that they don't even um come to the ministry or come to the ministry, but they, they heard the word and they sowed a seed into the ministry. I thank God for that. So it's, it's uh God instructed Moses to bless the children of Israel when they were leaving to go into a different promised land. God had gave word to bless his people. And I'm going to find this scripture. And it says in Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 to 27. Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 to 27. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord be gracious to thee. The Lord lift his countenance upon thee 
and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, ask this benediction. As Moses instructed Aaron to speak to the children of Israel, I speak this word over your people tonight, God, who hear this word, that you would bless them, what their heart's desire is, God, and what they need. That you would be glorified, oh God, even in our giving tonight. That everything we sow, God, we sow to the kingdom of God for the building of your kingdom. That you would be glorified. And I ask tonight, oh God, those who may be traveling to some places tonight, oh God. Some might be at work, getting ready to go home, God. That you give them traveling grace. That you cover them and protect them from danger seen and unseen. From the attack of the enemy that's lurking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That you, God, will go before them as a shield and a buckler, Lord God. And that they will abide under the shadow of the Almighty, under your protection forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. The Lord says the same. We'll be back again next week at the 6 o'clock hour on Tuesday. Share this video. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I tell you all the lessons and all the radio shows that I've been doing for the last two years or so. They're all posted on my page on YouTube. So subscribe to my channel. Encourage others to subscribe to my channel, and I guarantee you will forever be blessed. The Lord says the same. Shalom. May the peace of God can be blessed be upon you, the well-being, and God supply your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And again, thank you everyone for coming on tonight. Pastor Terry, I saw you here tonight. God bless you, my son, and many others. Uh, Pastor Denise, Sister Davis, God bless you all. I can't call all the names. Minister Eric, many of you that's on tonight, God bless you. Until next week, Lord says the same. Have a good night. Amen.